Good morning, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg for the Sales Pro Network. It is Friday, July 26th. If you have not joined us before, I am a sales coach and trainer with almost 50 years of experience, and I founded the Sales Pro Network about four years ago to elevate the profession of sales, to give salespeople a place where they can hang out, talk to each other, get great advice and coaching. And if you've been with us before, you know that every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern, we either do a live training or a live interview with somebody who can add value to the profession of sales. Now, our guest has not showed up yet for today, so we're going to give him another 60 seconds or so. And if not, I'm going to say goodbye. But uh, while we're waiting to see if he shows up, uh, he did confirm, by the way, so I hope he'll be here. And he's a great guy. Um, one thing that you might want to keep in mind is that if you have not already gotten at least halfway to your annual goal for the year, now is the time to take action. Now is the time to reach out, get some help, read a book, go to a seminar, talk to your manager, hire a coach, do something, but you don't want to wait till the end of the year, till it's November or December, and then figure out, oh my goodness, I'm not going to reach my goal. Uh, it's too late. So now is the time to do it. I'm very excited because our guest did just show up and I'm going to bring him up in a second. Uh, while I'm, uh, there we go, while I'm introducing him. All right, now we're talking. So this gentleman's podcast features over 800 episodes, and it's ranked in the top 2.5% of all podcasts globally, the top 2.5%. And there's a number of podcasts out there, so that's saying something. He's got an audience in over 100 countries. He's an author of three best-selling books. He's an expert on influence and the hidden lessons of failure, and he's the founder of 14 Startups. Please welcome today's guest, Matt Brown. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Jeff. Great to be here, man. It's great to see you. I'm really excited to talk to you. You you, you are this level podcaster and I'm this level podcaster, so I'm <laughs> going to do my best to be a professional today. Um, before I get started with the million and one questions I have for you, could you maybe give us the two or three minute background? What brought you up to this point? Uh, just a lot of failure, really. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you mentioned, I've been, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I build and sell companies. Uh, a lot of those companies uh, did, in fact, fail. Um, and with the podcast, it was just something that I, I never planned on really having 10 for 10 years, which I do now. Um, so the, the why behind the show was just ultimately to make a difference to business owners, entrepreneurs around the world through information at, uh, at scale or sharing information at scale. Um, and so I only wanted to do like three episodes and, um, I was launching a product. I was going to do three interviews and then I just got the bite, you know, or I should say the medium chose me. Um, and it's just been an incredible journey. You know, 10 years later, I look back and I think it's the best, uh, you know, business decision or investment of my time that I've ever made. Wow. Amazing. Now, one of the things that I know you believe is that everything is the way it is because someone, usually an entrepreneur, changed the way it was. C can you explain that a bit? Uh, well, it's true, right? I mean, if you think about who really changes the world or who puts a dent in the universe, it's the people who are prepared to take the risk to do something, to change something. Um, and entrepreneurship is all about risk. Um, so, you know, what type of business do you want to build? What type of product do you want to build? You know, cash flow risk, um, you know, teams, hiring people risk, uh, you know, raising money risk. Um, so everything about entrepreneurship or building companies is really about risk management. Um, and so when you think about visionaries, which is what entrepreneurs really are. They look at a problem that the world has and then they go out there and solve it. Um, and so if you think about what changes the world, it's problems being removed from society. Um, and so that person or that profile of person or that avatar is usually an entrepreneur. Hmm. And how do you define entrepreneur? I mean, I'm, an, I, I, I'm one, a one-man show. I'm an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Well, I guess the question is, you know, are you born one or can you become one? And I think entrepreneurship is something that anyone can do, but it's not for everyone. And so how you define an entrepreneur is really subjective. But for me, it's about someone that's prepared to take a risk and to build something that really matters to the world. If you think about Elon Musk, you know, Jeff Bezos, anybody that's really become uber successful, even the guys that have built, you know, built a business to a million dollars in revenue a year. These are people who are successful. They've they've taken a risk at something um, and they've gone out there and solved the problem. And the world really cared about that solution. And ultimately, that's what allowed them to leave the kind of legacy or make the kind of impact that they want in the world. Mm. 
Got it. Yes. And whenever I think of uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, I always think of myself too, you know, me, those two right in the same category. <laughs> you know, it, you're right about risk. You know, while I am a very small company, uh, I work with major companies as well as companies that nobody's ever heard of. But it is a risk every time because uh, in, in my business, I eat what I kill. Uh, mm. Don't kill, don't eat. So, uh, you know, it, that that you have to have that willingness to take the to, to believe in yourself and to take the chance that you actually do have something that people want, need, can use, and that you're able to have conversations with them in a way that some of them want to pay you to do do that thing or give them that product, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you think about Africa, some obviously from South Africa, a lion, uh, you know, on the Great Plains of Africa, he's he has to eat, right? So he, if he doesn't kill, he dies. Um, and so entrepreneurship is really a mindset first and foremost. It's like, I'm going to do this thing no matter what. There's no plan B, there's only plan A. And if plan A fails, then the only uh, you know next step is plan A again, but just doing it better. Um, and I think about you know why businesses fail most of the time. It's because entrepreneurs quit. It gets too hard. You know they can't afford to pay their rent, or you know their wives tell them that they must go and get a job because the wives they can't deal with the anxiety or the the uncertainty of what it means to be an entrepreneur. So you know lions always eat. If they don't they die. And that's really the mindset of an entrepreneur. Yeah, I've got it. I, I often uh, tell salespeople that you know, I'm a very positive thinker. I, I have a great attitude. But when it comes to my business, I act as if if I don't get X, Y and Z done by this week, I might lose my job. Now, the truth is nobody can fire me. But I again, I'm very positive and I don't live in fear. But I act as if there's this fear that I don't want to go get a real job. I, I, that's the last thing I want to do. I love working for myself and I love doing the things I do to help people. So I, I work as if I had a boss. And if I don't get this done, I'm going to get fired because the last thing I want is some boss telling me what to do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the only certainty is uncertainty, isn't it? I mean, it never gets this. You don't, you know, wake up with a business doing $10 million a year uh, in year seven and then have zero uncertainty. Like it, you know, it just doesn't happen. So yeah. the trick is to really deal with the uncertainty that comes with building a business it's, or the uncertainty that comes with taking a risk uh, in, in anything that you do in business. And I think part of it is the confidence in yourself that no matter what comes, you're going to work it out. You're going to work through it, around it, over it, under it, what, whatever you have to do to make sure that you can kill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's always another move. I believe, you know, even when um, you think that there's nothing left that you can do to save your business, when I've been there many times, there's always another move. And so the trick is to uh, essentially figure out, you know, answers to questions. So if you keep asking different questions and you keep getting different answers, then there's a very strong probability that you should continue with that business. However, if you keep asking different questions and there are no more different answers, then it's probably the right time to think about, you know, closing shop and starting something else. Got it. Um, about a month ago, you posted something. You said, when you market your product, prospects think you want their money. And when you market the problem, they see that you want to help. Mm -hmm. So when most people think about salespeople, uh, and that's the audience for this, uh, they think that we're lying, thieving, thieving scum dogs who just want to reach our hands into their pockets and take their money. How can we change that by marketing the problem? Well, the insight here is that people love to talk about their solutions first. Um, so, you know, you've built this new SaaS app or this new AI integrated, you know, custom AI agent thing. And, you know, and while that's sexy and cool, your customers really don't care. So what we find in B2B sales uh, most of the time is that people want to talk about themselves or their solutions first. Um, and the opportunity really is to own the problem. It's a principle of category design. So at our company, we've built something called the lightning strike. And that entire system uh, is designed to own a problem for our clients in the minds of their customers. Because if you own the problem better than the competition, you by default become the defining solution in its new category. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I love when I hear somebody like yourself saying the things that I actually believe too. So many salespeople make the horrible mistake of thinking that it's all about giving a great presentation. Let me tell you why my company, my product, my service is the greatest thing in the world and why you should be buying it. And if you don't, you're a moron. Now, nobody ever says those words, but that's kind of what you're get, uh, saying. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, it's not about us at all. It's all about the prospect and helping them see that what we have is right for them, can, can solve a problem and uh, them choosing to do business with us. It, it, one of the yeah. things I, I despise is when a salesperson walks in and says, hey, let me, first of all, thank you for your time. And let me tell you why my company is the greatest in the world. It's, it's wrong. It, it, it's all about making the prospect the star of the show and really finding out what they're looking for so that you can see if what you've got will serve them. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, if you think about a sales meeting, right? So it's a 30, 30 minute sales meeting. How do you spend your time? What do most salespeople do? They spend five minutes, you know, so tell us a little about your company and who's your customer and, you know, uh, what what do you, what is a problem for you in terms of your sales or whatever the case is. And they, earn, they spend literally five minutes of that 30 minutes window trying to understand the problem. Whereas it should be all 30 minutes should be dedicated to figuring out the problem. And so if you spent the last five minutes then saying, well, I think I've got a solution for you that can help you do or, you know, take the pain away from these three things that you said were strategic challenges for you. And in the next meeting, I'm going to present a solution or a proposal or a strategy that's going to help you to see how we can demonstrate uh, solving that problem for you in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Um, and so most sales meetings suck. I mean, the other day I was on a, a sales call. Uh, we were looking for a partner for a particular um, uh, strategy um, and the guy pitched up and he went uh, so tell me a bit about your company so you know if a salesperson says that i immediately get my backup because you should know what my business is you should know that showworks media uh, is an ai publishing and marketing company right uh, you should know based on my website and based on my social uh, graph and the content that i'm putting out what I'm trying to do. And so most salespeople are grossly underprepared. They just are. And so I said to the guy, dude, you literally are unprepared. Like you should know what this is. Like if you just spent two minutes before the call looking at my website, you wouldn't waste my time asking me stupid questions that you should already know the answers to. You know, and eventually he goes, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm like, no, dude, no. If you're trying to get my money, and remember that in the US, it's a hyper competitive market, there are many other people that sell what you sell, right? Which was like social ads management. And mm -hmm. so every prospect is trying to commoditize you from second one. They want to commoditize you because they feel like you're just another salesperson. And so the way that you differentiate yourself from my experience is by being prepared. Right. So looking at what like you actually from I do a lot of podcast interviews and you're like very well prepared. You know what contents I've been putting out. You know exactly how you're going to structure this engagement. And the same principle stands true. Yes, the context is different. This is a podcast, but a sales meeting is exactly the same. If you come in prepared, I, I immediately feel that you actually care about me, which goes back to the previous question, which is, uh, you know, talk to me about my problem. Like know and be prepared before you come in uh, to a sales engagement um, because most of your competitors just aren't. They just aren't. And so if you can create a sales experience that's different, that talks to me, that is well prepared, well articulated, you've got great questions before you actually get into the sales meeting, that's how you win. That's how you get meeting too. That's how you get that sale at the end of the day. Complete agreement. Uh no salesperson should ever be asking, tell me about your company. The question should be about the problem that you can solve and finding out what they're doing now to do that, why the problems are and all that stuff. And then doing exactly what you just said. Let's have another meeting where I'll come back and share with you how I might be able to help you. The only mm -hmm. thing I would change in what you said in a 30 minute meeting, I'm not going to spend the entire 30 minutes just finding that out. I'm going to spend a little bit of time up front trying to establish some rapport. And, but then I'm getting right to the questions. And to me, the majority of the time in the sales process is spent in the information gathering stage. But you're right. It's certainly not asking stupid, obvious questions that you can answer by a quick Google search. It, it, 
I mean, fortunately for me, most salespeople are not great at their jobs. Otherwise, I'd be out of business. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 they make us all look bad. Uh, you know, sales. Uh, my my stepfather was a career salesperson. Said sales is a great career, and it actually is. It's a great career, and he said, "Here's why." Every day you get to wake up and look yourself in the mirror and give yourself a raise. Then all you have to do is go out and earn it. And you earn it by speaking to enough people and show, finding out enough information so that you can share with them how you'll solve their problem. <clears throat> and also understanding that not everybody's going to be your customer. Some will, yes. some won't. So what? Move on to the next one. But you've got to be speaking to enough people. I, I want to move on because uh, you wrote a book called Secrets of the Fail. Uh, uh, it's actually hashtag fail. Uh, what secrets can we learn from the hidden failures of entrepreneurs? Geez, so many, man. So basically the backstory to that was I do these series on my show. So we tackle specific things like, you know, failures in business or uh, influence or whatever it might be or scaling startups. Um, and so in this particular case, um, if you look at LinkedIn uh, and you're scrolling down the timeline, like what do you see? It's like everybody's so successful. It's like, well, we've just won this account. You know, this person's just got this new job. This company's just merged with this one. This company's just been acquired. And, you know, I was like, you know what? Fuck that. I know that in business and entrepreneurship, like behind all of that success is an incredible amount of failure. And I think that we celebrate failure, uh, sorry, success more than we do failure. But actually to become successful, you have to fail many, many times over. Um, and so the strategy or the idea behind that particular series was to uncover these failures and to cover the lessons, to uncover, well, how did you overcome that, uh, you know, that incredibly challenging time? So I did about 150 interviews with CEOs of around $10 billion companies, all about their biggest failures. Um, and, you know, going back to mindsets and things like that, I think one of the key uh, sort of takeaways for me was that failure is a prerequisite to success and that, you know, um, as a community of salespeople, business owners, business leaders, et cetera, we should talk more about our failures and celebrate those failures, even internally as a culture, to create a culture that embraces failure or innovation. Uh, the, these are the companies that build the best products faster than the competition. Um, and so the show was very successful. Then I wrote the book off the show. Um, it became a bestseller, but it was all about just letting the world know and painting a counter narrative really to what you see on LinkedIn, that failure is bad. And I think it's something that we learn from school, even in sales. It's like, oh, I lost that deal. Um, I'm a failure. It's like, no, you're not a failure. This is just part of the process. And you need to get to a thousand no's. Like I celebrate the no's. I'm like, great, great. I can get on to the next guy, like your, to your point earlier. Um, but yeah, it was just about helping the community of business leaders understand that failure is necessary and that the more you fail, the, the more successful you become. Um, and these stories were incredible. You know, some, some of these companies were, you know, uh, 250 people, private equity firms involved, and then suddenly the market changes. And then that company dropped to five people, like literally within six months. So there, there was an IPO on the table, like, you know what I mean? Like just crazy, crazy like life-changing financial freedom opportunities and then it all like in a matter of months just blew up and then that same uh entrepreneur just persevered continued pivoted the company you know raised some capital and eventually there were 500 people listed on the uh, uh, or did an ipo like you know five years later it's like these sorts of things um and it all just talks to the mindsets of what it actually takes to be a successful uh, salesperson or business owner today yeah it, uh... You said something so near and dear to my heart. Uh, nobody closes everybody, and you're going to hear no a lot. And mm -hmm. I always say I have two favorite words in sales. Yes is my very favorite, but no is my second favorite. And it's a very close second. I, I, I don't know that I love no, but I, I do know that every no that I get gets me one step closer to the next yes, and that it's going to take a certain amount of no's to get those yeses. And that's one of the things that all salespeople should know for themselves. What are their actual metrics? How many no's equals a yes? Because that's one of the things that allows you to keep pounding through every single day hearing no 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 because you know that six no's equals a yes or ten whatever the number is um so uh i, I think too many people you know you said something so so um right on and it's not just linkedin it's all social media mm -hmm. you know you look at TikTok and facebook it's people on fabulous vacations and driving huge cars and you know all that stuff and you start it's easy for people to think Jesus, why am I such a loser? Look at the life that everybody's leaving. 
uh, leading. In fact, when I formed this group, this was originally formed as a Facebook group, a free Facebook group called the Sales Pro Network. Uh, and I investigated other Facebook groups for salespeople. And every single one of them was the same thing. It was a bunch of people bragging about how many deals they closed, how much money they made, what kind of car they're driving. And I'm like, fuck, mm -hmm. that's just not, I mean, look, are there successful people in life? Sure there are, but not mm -hmm. everybody. And those successful people almost definitely had to go through a bunch of failures, like you said, to get where they are. I, I don't remember the exact number anymore because I don't read it anymore, but uh, Forbes magazine comes out with the list every year of their uh, 400 most wealthy people in America. I used to get it every year because I was fascinated. And I don't remember the exact number, but of the people who did not inherit their wealth, in other words, the people who created their own wealth and got onto that list, a huge percentage of them had declared bankruptcy at least one time. So it, it's part of the deal. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about what is the P3 framework? I, I love acronyms and, and stuff like that. What's the P3 framework? Yeah, so... Um, it's basically a communications framework, uh, but it can be applied to different types of assets. So one of those types of assets is a best-selling book. Um, and so we produce a lot of uh, B2B books for CEOs and entrepreneurs and stuff like that. And uh, when you start um, you know, the, the process of becoming or writing a book or becoming an author, one of the things uh, most uh, let's just say executives do is they focus on information first and so they want to overwhelm the prospects with information they want to overwhelm the reader with over with information and so on and so one of the things i learned uh, some time ago now was that the structure of information is more important than the information itself it's the same reason why you can immediately uh, resonate with a netflix series or hate it is because the structure sucks or same thing applies to the movie um, industry and so forth it's the reason why you can read like three or five pages of a book and then put it down and you know whereas you read another book and you just can't put it down uh, it's because of the structure of information the same by the way applies to sales um, uh, meetings as well or keynote presentations and so forth so the p3 framework stands for problem product and proof so uh, what's the problem right that you are solving what are the nuances within that problem what does the data say about the problem market insights trends things like that perceptions what have you then product is obviously the product so how does the product now solve the problem that you've just told the reader or the customer that you uh, that they have um, and then proof so we have a mantra at showworks media which is no proof no launch um, mm -hmm. and so proof is well demonstrate to me how you have solved that problem for a customer before and so it's just about the structure of information. I can share one more quick framework that also works really well. Uh, it's called care, believe, no, do. So in a sales presentation, give them reasons to care. Well, you said that you have these problems, you wanna increase your revenue by this, this, and that, or so whatever the case might be, uh, but give them reasons to care first. Uh, then you give them reasons to believe. So tell them, or give them reasons to believe about the care you've just given them. So if they say that, um, you know, they, their um, their problem is they want to increase revenue by 10%, well, give them reasons to believe that you can solve that thing. Um, and then tell them what you want them to know. So give them facts about the care and the believe, and then tell them what you want them to do. So if you just follow basic frameworks, like you can communicate better, you can structure your presentations better, you can host a better podcast, and it's, it's a funny thing because, you know, if you want to focus on like the information, like tell me about all these things, but it's like, hang on, you have to structure your interview in a certain way so that it keeps people uh, or keeps, uh, you know, people's attention. And we're in the attention game, first and foremost, you know. Um, so, yeah, P3 framework, care, believe, no do. Love that. Now, you mentioned that, that you uh, help people write books. Most people think they've got a book inside them. I, I co-authored too, but... We cheated. We used a ghost, a ghostwriter, which was amazing. Uh, this guy's written over 250 books for various people, and he has an amazing ability to write in other people's voice. It's really astounding. But um, it takes a lot of time to write a book. I, I think I saw that you said for the average person it takes about six months. But you help authors streamline that journey. How, how do you do that? Well, it actually takes longer than six months. The average book takes between 12 and 18 months uh, to do. And, you know, if you're a CEO or a business owner or whatever, you're an executive or subject matter expert, um, it takes 12 to 18 months because, you know, you just don't know any better. So, like, like when I wrote uh, my first bestseller in 2015, 
my podcast was blowing up at the time and there was this publisher that kept hounding me he's like write a book write a book write a book i'm like dude i don't have the time my businesses were scaling at the time and whatever and eventually i just like some of my uh, other entrepreneur buddies are like dude just write the book um so i'm like fine so i signed the deal with the publisher she phoned me nine months later and she said matt where's the book and i hadn't written a single word uh because it just i didn't have the time to do it and so Eventually, obviously, we did it, became a bestseller, we reached over a million entrepreneurs, and it was awesome and whatever, but I swore I'd never write another book again. Uh, but then you get the itch, right? And so a, a best-selling book, not a book, like books are easy, but a best-selling book is hard. Um, and so we we only deliver best-selling books because it drives credibility and reputation and trust more than anything else, which is the basis of sales, right? Um, and so um, I developed a system uh about 18 months ago that produces a manuscript in about eight hours wow. so the old way was you know 12 to 18 months of pain dealing with ghostwriters thankfully you had a good experience but most you know people don't most most ghostwriters can't write in your tone they don't get the nuances of the story correct they just you know and then they're expensive and even then assuming you find a good ghostwriter you only have the book so what about everything else that has to go along with that what about the content marketing what about the advertising what about the pr the podcast tours you know blah 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 and so we've developed a system that basically takes all the pain away but it's basically based on content first not the book so we structure a video production plan around the, the chapter outline of the book. And then basically we follow some, kind of like a podcast process where we interview you and you're basically, you know, vomiting out all your subject matter expertise and what have you and all the stories and this and that. Um, and then we use a number of uh, prompts. We do a lot of prompt engineering here. We're using different AI platforms for different things. But basically we take the transcripts from the videos and then we use a AGI to essentially produce the manuscripts. It's incredible. So it actually marries your tone. It gets all, all the details around the story uh, and, 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 and. And so uh, what's also beautiful about the process is now you've also got your content for your marketing, right? Mm. Um, and so then we use, again, AI to, you know, repurpose all sorts of assets and that kind of stuff. We usually produce about a year's worth of content to market a book. Um, and then we launch the thing. Uh, we've got a lot of data intelligence on Amazon's marketplace. So we guarantee bestseller status for, for leaders. Um, and it's a and it's an amazing process. Like Secrets of Influence was used, uh, you know, created with that process. Secrets of Veil was used with that process. And I can promise you now, those two books I never, ever would have written if I had to sit down and write. Mm. Ever. Like never, ever. Wow. Um, and so when you think about impact, which is what books are really about, we're in the impact business. You know, so how do you... Uh, and this is, by the way, what influence is, it's about the ability of leaders to elevate others. Um, and so impact and influence go hand in hand and authorship or best-selling books is the vehicle through which you do that. Amazing. And, and, am I right? I believe you actually guarantee that when you take on a client that their book will be a bestseller or I think they get their money back. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So we actually have um, offers, you know, become a best-selling author in 30 days or you don't pay. So, yeah, we've got a we've got the best delivery model in the U.S. by, by a mile. And, um, and, yeah. And, and you, if I'm right, your proven approach uh, to unlock business growth includes authorship mm -hmm. and content creation, cold outreach, warm outreach and digital advertising. Can, can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah. So we focused on the niche of publishing first uh, because we wanted to get traction or at least you know create impact quickly. Um, but at the moment, we're actually repositioning the company to extend into AI-driven sales and marketing solutions. So publishing is still part of that. Uh, but we're, you know, we're building custom AI agents. I've got Matt Brown AI, which I can talk to you about uh, if you'd like. Uh, but there's just so much scope for impact, which goes ab above and beyond uh, just authorship. So custom AI agents, you know, accelerating, um, you know, prospect meetings without you being there, uh, reducing outbound sales calls using salespeople, but using you know AI agents to do it. Um, we're using uh, cold uh, email systems that use AI and you know multiple domains and something called the Unibox, which basically manages you know emails that, that are inbound from prospects without anybody being there. Yeah, it's just there's so many different use cases at the moment. So 
yeah, we're kind of moving into a different space entirely, which allows us to create more impact over and above authorship. I still believe everybody, as you said, should definitely write a book at some point. Um, and um, and yeah, it's a, and it's ex it's an exciting time. So it's direct outreach, you know, marketing automation, custom AI agents, blah blah blah, AI publishing. And so depending on what the problem is to our conversation earlier, we'll custom build a solution or a strategy around that problem. Incredible. We're talking to Matt Brown. We're about halfway through the interview and we're going to take a 60 second break for a, a commercial from our sponsor, which is me. Hi, I'm Jeff Goldberg, the founder of the Sales Pro Network. For nearly five decades, I've been selling, managing, coaching and training salespeople internationally. And I'm often asked for one on one or private coaching but it does involve a substantial investment. For that reason, I've recently developed the SalesPro Insider Network community. It works like this. We get together twice a month on Tuesday nights from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. At the first session of the month, it's you and me with me taking your questions and giving you the advice and help you need to both prospect and sell more effectively. At the second session of the month, we'll have a guest coach speaking on a fascinating topic that helps sellers like you and me. And of course, we'll do group coaching then too. The best part is the investment is just $27 for the first month, and there's no long-term contract at all. In fact, you can cancel it anytime. Go to crushsalesgoals.com. That's C-R-U-S-H-S-A-L-E-S-G-O-A-L-S.com. I hope to see you there. We had a great guest uh, just this past Tuesday night, Michael Leibowitz, who is uh, the mind magnetizer. He helps people craft their message in a way that their prospects actually want to hear it. And this next month's guest is Patty Johnston, who is an expert on eliminating procrastination and who doesn't need some help with that. If anybody's interested, you can either DM me through Facebook or LinkedIn, or you can go to crushsalesgoals.com and you can register to get a free pass to come to attend. And we're back with Matt Brown. He's a global business podcaster, an expert on influence and so many other things. And Matt, I do want to ask you about Matt Brown AI, but before, uh, before I, I do that, um, you, you help authors go from unknown to bestseller. I mean, it, is that the process you were talking about before? I mean, what's the secret sauce? Uh, uh, you know, so, I, I know that some people have ways of buying their way to the top of the list, and I don't think that's the, the right way. Uh, how, how, how do you go from unknown to bestseller? <clears throat> yeah, it's a very good question. So one of, the thing, uh, one of the things that frustrates me quite a bit is you've built a successful company or you've been in sales for 20 years or you've you've got some kind of body of work, right? You, there's a subject matter expertise that you've learned over a period of time. And so the frustrating part of that for me is when I get, yeah, so when I sell my company, then I'll do it. Or uh, it's not the right time to uh, for me to write a book or we're busy uh, raising capital right now um, and I don't have the time. And so, you know, it's the same thing, like when is the right time to, to start a business? Well, there's never a right time. You just do it, right? And so... If you have three competitors and competitor C has written the book, the best-selling book on the customer problem, and the customer knows this, who do you think they're going to choose? Yeah, C. well, you, right? You're the guy, customer C. Um, and so there's an incredible amount of value in becoming a, a you know a best-selling author. So the process to become a best-selling author is really not complicated. So when we uh, list a book on the amazon marketplace we have a lot of data intelligence so we can you know we know how many sales in a day you need to make to become number one to be in the top 10 or whatever the case is so once we understand that we basically build a, a sort of a, a launch system around the book which includes a number of components one of those things is uh, email another one's amazon ads the other one's content the other one's digital advertising the other one's newsletters so depending on what the client has available to them like some guys are sitting with you know ten thousand, <laughs> you know uh customers or leads within their uh, crm system so depending on what uh, you know assets we have that we can leverage uh it's really about knowing well where do we need to get to like anything right where do you need to get to um and then listing the book in the right categories to ensure that you actually hit the number one spots uh, so it's really not that complicated to be to be very honest with you. It's just that when you're sitting on the outside and you're just like, well, I want to become an author, like you just don't know uh, any better. And so when you have a specialist that understands these things and that can guide you and kind of be a, a, a Sherpa, you know, if you like to get you to the top of the mountain, um, that's really where we come in. Wow. Uh, 
John Hill, one of our listeners, says, I really enjoy listening to Matt. He makes a lot of sense. I agree, John Hill. You're absolutely right. Uh, and, and you're also right about books. Um, it's amazing how when you hand a prospect a book that you have almost instant credibility. And I told you I co-authored two books. Neither of them are about my area of expertise, which is sales. Mm -hmm. uh, one is about leveraging your laziness, which is not really about being lazy. The other one's about how to be your own coach. But I've gone on sales calls and just given them one or the other and immediately people think you know what you're talking about, yeah. uh, even though you could be the biggest moron in the world, but that that physical book seems to give you credibility, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's the best business card you can ever have. I mean, I'm not saying that you need to write three, right? And that's probably not for everybody, but certainly do one. Like if, you, if you're a, a startup and you have a vision for the future, write a book about that. You can take that book, give it to venture capital firms so that they can understand what it is that you're trying to do or the impact that you're trying to make in the world. I mean, I've got another client of mine, uh, Mike Domano, he runs um, a billion dollar uh, workers comp company. What's well, actually a group employing shows, et cetera. So he's looking to raise money from PE firms, but now they've built an incredibly disruptive, nuanced, complex marketplace that is disrupting a $9.7 trillion uh, employment industry in the US, right? So if you have a pitch deck, that's one thing, it'll get you some of the way there but if you can give the pe firm and the, the you know the investment principle for you know an venture capital firm the book that they can read and digest it just creates like well shit you actually wrote the book on this thing mm -hmm. right i mean i've got another client uh, i can't mention the name because i'm under nda but um they're basically merging with another mass massive company it's listed and what have you um and we're doing a book for her and when she told them that you know we were creating a best-selling book for her they got all excited because they were like holy shit if we could add in our story at you know in the final section of the, of a best-selling book at the time that the merger goes through that would be awesome you see so it's less about you know book sales it's like like well what can you do with it you know i mean we're doing some very interesting things with like uh, you know ai or custom ai uh, agents and stuff Agents is not really the right word, but um, basically taking content around the book, the book content itself, all the information from a, company, a customer's website and building an AI agent that can actually talk in multiple languages. So if someone, if you've written a book in English, how do you get that book to be consumed in Japanese? If you're a global company, which is actually uh, one of my clients, Simon Taylor, um, he, we did this book for him. Um, and so... Uh, if you're in the scale business, right, and you want to be able to have a platform or a tool that can allow people who are not native English speakers to consume the book, well, you can use AI to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, even like, you know, sending 500 books to CEOs of your dream clients and going, hey, put a handwritten note in there and say, hey, you know, we'd love to start a conversation with you, but we've written the book about the problem that you have. You see what I mean? Um, yeah. And so once you're a best-selling author, you're like a best-selling author for the rest of time. Like no one can ever take that status away from you. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a great believer in influence. And so um, books are one of the ways to do that. Yeah. And you, you used the phrase a few minutes ago, you know, the guy who wrote the book, you know, yeah. when, when somebody says, oh, that's the guy who wrote the book, you're automatically accepted as an expert in what, whatever you're doing. Yeah. Amazing. Sure. Uh, you, you brought this up before and I did want to ask you about it. What is Matt Brown AI? Yeah, so it's super cool. I mean, I keep, um, I, this is the interesting question to ask salespeople specifically, which is, what is your true value? And what answer would you give to that question? And so most of the time when I ask people that question, salespeople, or whatever, they usually go, well, our value is in the solution and how it solves that problem. And so if I use the map around show as an example of that, if I said to you, uh, Jeff, like, what is my value as the host of the map round show well um, i could in you know interview a ceo and he could pay me five thousand dollars and you know for an hour and he can promote the shit out of whatever he wants um and you know i could give him reach in 100 countries around the world and yes there's some value in that but what i'm doing is it's about the solution you see but the real question is and it's not something that's kind of directly obvious but my real value is not in that at all my real value is in the 850 interviews i've done with these super successful people, like all the secrets of fail stuff, like, <clears throat> you know, we did this, all the investment shows we've done uh, with the biggest VC firms in the US, et cetera. So I've got this huge body of work and I keep going back to that. 
Uh, so if you have a body of work, like think about it, think about, well, what could you do to leverage your influence, you know, using that body of work? And so who has time to listen to 850 interviews of Matt Brown show? Nobody is. But what I what we've built, which is Matt Brown AI, we've taken all of the interviews, trained the AI on that, all my content, all my thought leadership stuff, all my books, basically everything I've ever done in the last 10 years. Um, and it's free. And so what I'm able to do is scale my influence. So yes, the show is the show. But now what I'm able to do is really scale my influence. I can influence a million entrepreneurs through Matt Brown AI who have a problem like, dude, do I need a business plan? Should I, you know, should I quit my business? Uh, what, how should I tell a story in the sales deck or whatever? You know, tell me a story about failure. Like what's the big, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm suffering with something. I have a problem that I have um, and I need a mentor to do that. So I can't scale my time but I can scale my body of knowledge. And equally on top of that, going back to uh, this, you know, the languaging thing, I can influence you know, entrepreneurs in Chinese, Spanish, French, like any language in the world, all through uh, Matt Brown AI. And so you know, it's just the beginning of what I believe is gonna be a truly disruptive time, like AI and sales and marketing, all this kind of rubbish. But, um, but when it comes to influence and really creating impact, like Matt Brown AI is, is is something that I believe everybody will have in the future. Not I'm not saying like Matt Brown AI, but I'm saying Jeff Goldberg AI, uh, you know Elon Musk AI. Uh, you know what if you had? This was actually an idea that um, Mike phoned me. He's like, dude, I had a dream. I'm like, oh god, here we go. And he's like, I had a dream about your Matt Brown AI thing. I'm like, oh yeah. He's like, so what if you had like Gandhi, you know Nelson Mandela. Oprah Winfrey, uh, you know, um, Einstein, whatever, right? And you trained this AI, right, on all their knowledge, like all the publicly available stuff. And then the, the, the ingredient, though, is not in the training. It's actually in the personalization and context yeah. of that knowledge. Uh, but then imagine you had a board of advisors. Like, dude, I would kill to have Nelson Mandela give me advice about leadership. Do you see what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. And so I think, again, people are not thinking differently about what their value really is. Um, and so we all have an incredible amount of value. We just feel sometimes that we're constrained. We're not able to express that. Or, I don't know how to write a book. Uh, it's like, cool, well, you don't need to write a book, dude. Like if you've got a podcast or whatever the case is, um, you know, think about like, well, what if I had my own AI? Like, what would that mean for me? How could I use that AI to market myself, my, my sales services, my coaching, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. So, yeah, I think it's an important question to answer. Like, what do you think is your true value? Brilliant. And as you were describing that to me, my mind was going, oh, my God, what a great business opportunity here. Because everybody like Oprah Winfrey, you go to Oprah Winfrey and say, hey, let's create Oprah Winfrey AI. I mean, I think people would pay big bucks to have that service from somebody yeah. like you who can put that together for them. Yeah, and yeah. I think there's a lot of interest there. I Look, uh, like Oprah, don't like Oprah, it makes no difference to me. She's amazingly successful and has built herself from nothing up to this multi-billion dollar corporation, a phenomenon. I'd like to know the secrets of doing that. So Great, great opportunity there. And you, you've used the word influence a couple of times, and I want to, I want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, um, is there a difference between a thought leader and an influencer, or are they the same thing? No, they're not the same thing. Um, so <clears throat> when I ask, and I actually did, if I ask ten CEOs, like, you know, what is influence? You'll get ten different answers. Unfortunately, most of the time when you say they would influence people go, oh, does that mean influence or marketing? You have to have a million followers on uh, on LinkedIn or whatever, like across your social graph, or maybe you need to be host of the Matt Brown show, whatever the story is. And so um, influence and marketing sucks. Like I really fucking hate it. It's probably like one of the things I despise the most only because it's about self enrichment. So I paid Jeff Goldberg, you know, $5,000 to jump onto LinkedIn and to promote a product that Jeff Goldberg has never actually used. And so we keep seeing this stuff over and over again. And I understand why uh, marketing uh, teams specifically work with influencers is because they don't want to pay to build or reach that audience themselves. Unfortunately, it brings with it when anybody, and greed is a real thing, right? And so influencer marketing, some of them, it's like not all bad, but most of it is. Um, and so influence is re in the thought leadership space is very, very different. So thought leadership is about communicating original, non-obvious, evidence-based thinking. 
<clears throat> about a problem that your customers have, not the solution, but about the problem. Um, and so again, when you own the problem better than the competition, you'll inevitably win faster than uh, you know those you're competing with. And so influence is really about shifting perceptions and inspiring actions and driving decision making at scale. So it's funny because like when you, especially in the B2B sales space, it's like people are like, well, you know, they go to market with something. Like there's a message, there's a sales deck, there's some kind of communication. And most of the time we actually don't understand or are we we're actually not aware of what perceptions actually exist in the market. Well, you're too small for me. Uh, AI is something that I'll do in three years time. Uh, writing a book, it's not the right time. Uh, you know, whatever, like, uh, there's no return on investments in your, in, uh, in your solution, or I've tried that before and it didn't work. And so there's all these perceptions, right. That are in the minds of our prospects. And so the way that you shift perceptions and I share a framework to do this in my book, but basically you have to use evidence to do that. So if you think that it's not the right time, well, then give me evidence to prove that it is the right time. If you think that, you know, the, there's not going to be a sufficient return on investment, or maybe there's, it's going to take too long to get the kind of return uh, on investment that I'm looking for, well, then give me evidence to prove that you can do it, you know, in less time. Um, and so that's what thought leadership is about. It's about understanding what perceptions exist in the market and then providing evidence to shift those perceptions so that you can inspire an action and drive a decision. And then when you uh, create things like a thought media, uh, thought leadership platform, you can actually start to do these things at scale. So instead of trying to reach or shift uh, Jeff Goldberg's perception in a sales meeting, you actually do that, you know, a thousand fold, 5,000 fold, 10,000 fold. But as long as you understand what perceptions exist and you have evidence to shift those things, then you can start to do that. But if you don't have, if you don't have an awareness of what perceptions exist and you don't have evidence, then you actually have to go out there and get it. Yeah. Uh, when I think of influencer, I think of like a Kim Kardashian. You know, if Kim Kardashian uses your product, there's a certain amount of people that are going to use that product just because she's Kim Kardashian. Yeah. And it's never occurred to me that I want to be an influencer. Uh, but the reason I'm so active on LinkedIn is because I am looking to be known as a thought leader in the area of sales and sales management. It's why I post content daily and it's how I get a third of my business. Not from mm -hmm. me reaching out to people and say, hey, do you want to buy some sales training or some sales coaching? It's people reaching out to me saying, hey, I've been following your post for the last six months. You really seem to know what you're talking about. I want to talk to you about possibly doing some business together. Mm -hmm. uh, but today it seems like everybody wants to be an influencer. Uh, for many, it's actually seen as a real job. I mean, kids are graduating college with the goal of how do I become an influencer? And it can be a path to wealth and success. Um, one reviewer of your book said that you've unlocked the cheat codes to influence. In fact, you wrote the book, The Secrets of Influence. Why is influence so important? And what are some of the cheat codes we can use when we're selling? Yeah. So this is about um, leadership, right? So if influence is the currency of leadership impact, then impact is the legacy of that influence. And so there's no real cheat codes. I don't you know, see myself as unlocking cheat codes. I mean, I can share one story that probably explains why that comment was there, but, um, but this is about elevation. It's about elevating others. And so I'll tell you a quick story, which will put this whole principle into, into perspective. And, and it's probably a little bit of a cheat code. So uh, when I arrived in the US, uh, I lost all my network. This was about you know two years ago, uh, but I did have the show. So basically what I did was um, I sent a, a thousand emails to startups only in California who had raised a million dollars or more in the preceding uh, 12 months. And so I sent a very short email going, hey, briefly, you know, my name's Matt Brown. I host the Matt Brown Show, link out to the website. Um, you know, I'd love to interview you for, for an interview, give you some free PR exposure. I've interviewed New York Times bestselling authors, Steve Blank, Jeffrey Moore, blah, blah, blah. Uh, click here to book your interview. And I went to bed that night um, and I was like, you know, email, God. Um, and then I woke up the next morning and I was horrified. I had 190 booked interviews. Um, and for the next two months from nine to five, all I was doing was just interviewing these visionary founders, right? Um, and when, after I'd gotten through that whole hell, <laughs> that hellhound <laughs> of an experience, because I didn't expect it, but now I'm like, shit, I have to commit to this thing. I asked myself the question, like, well, what is this? Like, why did it work? Because people don't respond to email. So how do you get like 190 basically sales leads, right? 
uh, it, with with the sending of one email, it took five minutes to draft it. Like the ROI on that is is immeasurable. Like it's huge. And some of these guys became my clients and stuff. And like I landed on this idea of influence. And I was like, well, why why influence? What does it actually mean? Like, and in the context of that particular uh, tactic, right? Um, which was I was giving them a platform to tell their story for free. And as a startup, that's something that everybody wants. I want free, free exposure. We're building this cool thing. And you know what I mean? Uh, but it was really about elevating others. If I'd sent that same email and said, hey, my name is Matt Brown, or you know, same thing. However, I'd like to interview you and it's going to cost $500. Do you think I would have had any response at all? Probably, Probably not. not. No. Um, and so this is what I mean about influence. If, you're, if you put yourself in a position to make a positive impact to the people or markets that you care about, and you give before you look to receive, right? If I, the receive thing would have been pay me $500, but I was like, no, let me just give them access to my platform anyway. I mean, what do I stand to lose apart from the time sack of it? Uh, but a lot of these guys became my clients, you know, and then they referred me to other people. And so my network became my net worth. And so that's what I mean by a tactic. It's just, you know, using a platform that you own or a story that you own to create value in a way that doesn't actually suck. Um, and we get, I get pitched all the time, like by podcast, you know, booking agencies and PR firms and all this kind of stuff. Um, and they have no idea how to deal with a, a show host like Jeff Goldberg. I mean, you get pitched too, I'm sure. And it's yeah. like, you know, I've got this guy and, you know, his name's Greg Smith and, you know, he's a super ding dong guy and he built this thing and did that thing. And here's three things that you can ask him. It's like, fuck off. I don't actually need talent. I don't need talent. Um, I can get access to anybody I want through the show. Um, and yet these people are expecting me to give them something. Do you see what I mean? Like the relationships uh, yeah. incorrect, like there's chicken and egg here. It's like, well, what are you going to do for me, right? Before I consider interviewing this guy. Do you see what I mean? I do. Um, and I actually got one of those this morning, Matt. And it was yeah. actually pretty well written because she said, this guy, his name happens to be Jeff Wall. So, you know, he'd be a great guest for you. And he has a huge following and we will promote the crap out of this podcast if you interview him. So I thought that was very wise to start out the email that way. Otherwise, yes. I would not have read the rest of it or yeah. looked at his one sheet that, that she had attached. So, yeah, Dude, I, we, I just, we just actually pay people. We, just pay, pay, people for, we pay podcast hosts. Yeah. You know, going back to the podcast thing, there's over 3 million podcasts now. Over 80% of those don't actually produce any content. Of the remaining 20%, most of those shows are not generating any form of commercial return, like none. It's a time suck. And in fact, there's a whole graveyard of could have been successful shows that are on iTunes, Spotify, etc. cetera. Um, and so what we do is we just recognize the obvious truth that people's time is their most valuable resource. What is the average, let's just say, hourly rate of, um, you know, let's just say a podcast host? Well, it's zero. That's what it costs. That's actually what they're making, nothing. So it's actually just costing them time. Maybe they generate some needs off the back of the show, whatever. Um, but if you just pay them, listen, dude, I'll pay you $250 to interview this guy. Okay, it's taken an hour of your time. See, a fractional CMOs don't even earn that kind of money. <laughs> and then it's like, fuck, that is actually really different. You actually, you're rewarding me for my time. You know, you're not expecting me to give you my time for free just because you think you have a story from one of your clients that you want to push on my show, which by the way, has taken me 10 years to build. So, you know, so I think it's just approaching. And I love the fact that people are actually trying different things, but even like we'll promote the hell out of it. It's like, well, will you though? You know, and what's the real return for me? Well, there isn't any. Um, so anyway, um, I just think people need to approach platform owners like yourself and myself mm -hmm. and many others around the world just differently. Gotcha. Uh, you've interviewed some pretty cool people. I, I, I went to your website. Uh, who are some of the ones that you respect the most and, and why? Yeah, I get asked that sort of question a lot. It's very hard for me to, to land on it. Um, I think probably um, one of the unifying principles i suppose is those people who have overcome incredible incredible adversity you know i think those sorts of stories um really resonate with me and people a lot i mean when i started the show 10 years ago i mean like you know within 18 months i had an audience in 100 countries like how is it that some guy from south africa johannesburg has this massive show well, it shouldn't have happened i was just early right um but the answer to that question is, well, it's the stories, right? It's the stories that were being shared. Like people are always suffering every single day 
And that's why I wrote this book, uh, Your Inner Game, 12 Principles for High Impact Entrepreneurs. And this whole this whole book was basically a, rec uh, a sort of a, a, rec a recount of the most hardcore stories that at that time, I'd only done like 110 in, you know, episodes at that time. Uh, but it was all like these people who just like, holy shit, you did what? And it actually had nothing really yeah. to do with business necessarily. Some did. Um, but most of it was about, um, you know, human, uh, the human capacity to overcome. Um, and like, you know, some of the stories, this one uh, girl, her father owned a small holding and there was obviously, you know, lions and stuff. <laughs> and this girl's sitting in the lounge playing with her toys and the lion comes through the front lounge window, picks her up in his mouth and then runs back to the, they call it a crawl, which is like a pen. Um, and just this, this child is just getting mauled. And eventually, um, this very brave uh, farm worker basically, you know, got the lions back off or whatever. But she was like massively, massively um, traumatized by it, obviously, and physically, uh, you know, uh, let's just say, you know, disfigured and that kind of thing. It was all about her story and how she, you know, went on to do these cool things. I mean, just another guy got um, arrested for a murder he didn't commit in Zimbabwe. And he was put in maximum security prison in like the most unbelievable conditions. Like I still can't like when I was recording that 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 chapter in the audio book, I was like, <laughs> like I couldn't actually believe that this guy went through what he did, and now he's a professional speaker and you know he tours the world and that kind of stuff. But that's what I mean. It was all about these principles. Like, well, you know, know why? You know, uh, another guy, Joey Ev Evans. Um, wanted to complete the Dakar rally. Um, only seven South Africans have ever completed that race. Um, and he was uh, on a sort of qualifying event, and they call it the whole shot, which is the first corner. So he gets to the whole shot, loses the front of the bike, and he gets ridden over by the whole field. And he's basically paralyzed. Six different doctors told him he, he would never walk again. Um, and eventually he's lying in his hospital bed and he gets this itch in his right toe. And he's like, fuck, I'm going to start, you know, just I'm going to work this toe. I'm going to work this toe. Because uh, that's all he could feel. And eventually the feeling came back through his right foot and then up to his right leg. And then eventually went over to his left leg or whatever. Um, and he was in hospital for like six to nine months. Eventually came out of that, was on another qualifying event. He hits a cow doing like 100 miles an hour back in hospital, more broken bones, you know, just like crazy. Then he had to raise money for the Dakar, which is a very hard thing to do anyway. Um, and then he eventually gets the Dakar. This is like years of journey and suffering and pain. And um, and then he's on the penultimate stage, comes over a hill and this truck, they get different classes of vehicles, but this truck rides over his bike, just like completely destroys it. And there he's literally at the end after all of this stuff and his dream's over. Um, and so he just basically disassembles the bike and carries it literally in the sand. So he's walking, 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 and eventually comes over the hill and he sees this bike. It's the same model as his, um, and there's no one around. It turns out there was this French rider who had crashed, got airlifted to hospital. And so there's a rule in the Dakar that you have to finish the Dakar on the motorbike that you started. So there's the frame number that you have. Um, but the bike was the same. So he took the exhaust of this of the French guy's bike. He took the fuel, uh, you know, uh, the gas tank or whatever, and basically then rode for, I think it was like 18 hours straight with no sleep to finish the Dakar rally. It's like stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the book takes the principles of these stories and puts it into the context of uh, business and entrepreneurship. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you a million percent. It's those stories of overcoming horrible adversity just that just suck you in. Make yeah, you wanna, I, I, I can't wait to hear the next thing. I mean, I, I interviewed a woman once and I've forgotten her name, but uh, I think she might've come from South Africa. When she arrived in America, she was arrested at immigration because they thought she was a prostitute. And I think she spent 18 months in prison and it took her a long time to get out before she could prove it. And, you know, it makes her a great speaker. I, I, I know you're a professional speaker. So am I. And I, I, I don't want to bring bad stuff on myself, but sometimes I watch people and I go, oh, why don't I have something like that? I mean, I saw a guy once, he's got no arms and no legs, but he's a professional speaker. I'm like, oh, why can't I have something like that? Everybody's going to want, want to book me for that. And I know another guy, uh, his name is Rohan Murphy. Um, at a very young age, they had to cut off his legs because there was something wrong. But this guy went on. He's now a bodybuilder and a professional speaker. He's done Nike commercials. It's that overcoming adversity that we all get sucked into. And I see we're out of time. I could talk to you all day, Matt. Um, how do people uh, your books are all on Amazon, right? Yeah. <clears throat> OK. Yep. And how do people reach you if they're interested in talking to you or working with you? 
Um, yeah, you can go just Google uh, Matt Brown Show and you'll find a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then um, the company is called uh, Show Works Media. So it's show, W-O-R-X, uh, media.com. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm everywhere on online, dude. So wherever people are, all good. Got it. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your brilliance so generously. I'll end this as I always do. Gang, please remember that sales is a game of making things happen. So get out there and make sales happen. Have a great weekend, everybody. Have a great weekend, Matt. Thanks again. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you. Take it easy.